Konami's finally deciding to show Joey Wheeler some love by remastering his Flame Swordsman. Hello everyone, and today we're going to be talking about the Flame Swordsman, the brand new uh, sub-archetype of Fire Warriors introduced to Master Duel in the latest pack. And I've got to say, after playing this deck on stream on Twitch, by the way, shout out if you were there, this is legitimately probably my new favorite deck in the game. Uh, <laughs> I was already a fan of Infernoble, uh, being able to combine the best parts of Infernoble with a whole new engine that enables a series of lines that are... Uh, different, very different from what Infernoble normally does, uh, but still quite impactful. It adds to the end board of Infernoble under ideal circumstances, and what it does is provide you an additional layer or lane of play if you can't achieve those optimal outcomes. So in today's video, what I'm going to be doing is showing off a uh, one, a couple of combos basically with the deck. I'm going to show off the sort of Fighting Flame Swordsman by himself and what he does. Uh, which is decent. It's not like the most. Uh, this this card and this whole deck really comes to life when you start combining it with other cards in the deck, i.e. the Dia Bellstar cards, uh, a lot of the Infernoble cards as well enable a lot of synergy. So the Flame Swordsman cards by themselves set up interruptions. It's not terrible, uh, but the the main draw of the deck is what it does in two card combinations uh, pairing up with other cards. But once you kind of understand what the Flame Swordsman cards do, it's really not that hard to work it into your regular Infernoble workflow. Uh, this isn't going to be a full like Infernoble gang because I've already done that on the channel, uh, at least to some extent. I've done a couple of videos on these guys. Uh, so if you want to know like more about Infernobles themselves, I'd recommend checking out those videos. Uh, but this one is going to be primarily showing off the synergy between the two decks. So we'll, we'll do the combos. We've got some replays. I am going to go through the deck card for card at the end, talking about a lot of the synergy in a lot more detail. So if that's what you're after, of course, stick around to the end. But do watch the gameplay, because if you just skip to the end and you just can hear me saying words for 45 minutes or however long it's going to be, you're not going to take in any of that knowledge. So make sure you watch the gameplay first so you've actually seen it in action and you know what I'm referring to when I, when I say certain things and describe certain things combinations so i'm not going to take up too much time here at the start our live stream for this was a ton of fun we opened up uh 12 000 gems worth of packs we played some shining star cards and we played some infernoble on stream that was on twitch and we're going to continue live streaming on twitch as well so if you want to catch these live streams when they happen make sure you're subscribed and following on twitch as well but anyways let's just get into the combos all right, so to start off with, we're going to be looking at the, uh, just the flame, uh, the fighting flame swordsman by himself, right? So we're going to go, we're going to grab him off of Rota here. Um, so this card, again, this is not like an optimal one card starter or anything like that, but I do want to show you kind of what he does so that you understand uh, how he then works into your two card combinations and how to actually get to your ultimate flame swordsman. So we're gonna start off with normal summoning the fighting flame swordsman, a pretty decent normal summon. I would say maybe second or third best normal summon in the deck, kind of like right there with Augier, but Augier brings a little bit more versatility. Up to you. Uh, but we're gonna normal summon out the fighting flame swordsman. What that is gonna do is that's gonna grab us the flame sword realm. Uh, you can see we already had a copy in hand, of course, but whatever. Uh, now we're gonna activate the flame sword realm here. Flame Sword Drum is going to activate, sending the Fighting Flame Swordsman to the graveyard uh, to summon out the uh, OG Flame Swordsman from the extra deck. So it comes right out to the field. Uh, now that's going to trigger the Fighting Flame Swordsman to send a uh, card that mentions Flame Swordsman from deck to graveyard. So we're going to send our Salamandra. Salamandra then is going to activate, grabbing us a Salamandra Spell or Trap. We're going to grab, of course, the Salamandra Fusion. And then we're going to equip the fusion onto our flame swordsman. And then we can use the fusion, activating its effect. We can send this to the graveyard to summon out the ultimate flame swordsman. Oh, God, every time I summon this card, it's so cool. And then we can equip all the our flame swordsman, the salamandra, from the graveyard. Uh, now, what exactly is this? Very, very simply, is this card, uh, while it's up in the field and equipped with a card, can quick play, target a monster your opponent controls, destroy it, and inflict 500 damage. Very straightforward. He can also double his attack points if he battles, which does come up, actually, quite a bit. Uh, so do bear that in mind as well. Incredible at generating lethal damage when combined with the Flame Swords Realm, which can boost his attack points by a thousand. Uh, 
So yeah, that's essentially how the fading, uh, fading flame swordsman works. Like I said, even as a one card combo, being able to put up a an eruption just like that is totally fine, especially if you're trying to play through an eruption. But again, understanding sort of what those cards do in that series of plays, that little sequence, uh, you're essentially aiming to work that sequence into your infernoble combo in order to add the ultimate flame swordsman to your end board. And that is the goal, adding him to the end board, not having him instead of the end board, but adding him on. Uh, and two card combos are going to be how you do that. I do, however, want to show off uh, a couple of plays with the Sublimation Knight. I have two things I want to show off. A slightly more uh, detailed version of this, where we have the Ultimate Flame Swordsman, the Ferocious Flame Swordsman, and the Promethean Princess in Graveyard ready to go, as well as a uh, sort of full Infernoble line, both off of the Sublimation Knight. Alrighty, first of all, we're going to be showing off a Sublimation Knight combo that goes into your uh, Flame Swordsman place, right? So it'll end on Flame Swordsman plus Ferocious Swordsman, uh, Ferocious Flame Swordsman and Promethean Princess in the graveyard for not only an additional interruption, but also follow up during the next turn. Uh, so that is the idea behind this little combo. Very, very simple combo. Uh, probably not the greatest one you want to be doing with the Sublimation Knight, but I do want to show it off nonetheless to get at least an idea as to some of the synergy between the decks. Uh, so we're going to start off with our Sublimation Knight. We're going to grab our Squeak Knight directly from our deck. We're going to activate its effect. We're going to Special Summon it out to the field. Do not activate its on summon effect. Now we're going to go for a Sold using our two Warrior Monsters. Nice and easy. Nice, so it's going to activate, basically just going to grab us discard fodder here. Uh, whatever card we add to our hand here um, is going to be getting discarded. So don't grab anything super valuable. Uh, you might want to grab something like, um, just something useful and great for next turn. So I'm going to go for, say, Augear, right? Something that could be useful in the graveyard. So now we're going to activate the Assault, and this is where the two combos diverge. So you're going to mill four, no matter what, right? If you're doing this off a one card combo, you're going to mill four. Uh, you're going to mill these four equip spells. And you're either going to be going for your Fighting Flame Swordsman or for Augear. Uh, now, of course, I don't have, I can't go Augear because I added it to my hand off of Assault. But those would be your two choices. Uh, we're going to go for the Fighting Flame Swordsman. Fighting Flame Swordsman is going to activate as Chain Link 1. Our Gear Blade is going to activate as Chain Link 2. Gear Blade as an equip spell when sent to the graveyard um, as cost for a monster effect is going to add itself back to your hand, which is nice. It's always nice to have a recurring equip. Uh, we're going to grab our Swords Realm as well. Uh, Swords Realm, we're going to activate to essentially enable our whole fusion line. We're not going to do it right this second, though. First of all, we are going to go for the Promethean Princess. Uh, so we're going to go Link 2 and 1 into 3 for our Promethean. That's going to trigger our Fighting Flame Swordsman, which is going to mill our Salamandra. And then the Salamandra, when milled, is going to activate to grab us our uh, Fusion spell. The uh, Salamandra Fusion. Now we go Promethean Princess. Going to bring back our Fighting Flame Swordsman. Any Fire Warrior, doesn't re it doesn't really matter which. Uh, now we're going to go for our... Um, Continuous spell here, we're going to discard usually the card that you added to your hand off of the effect of Isolde. So we're going to drop the all gear that we searched for, we're going to summon out our uh, Flame Swordsman. Here it is. Uh, now we're going to equip our Salamander Fusion onto our Flame Swordsman. And we're going to activate the Fusion Spells effect. Uh, we're going to pitch both to summon out the Ultimate Flame Swordsman. Nice. Now, we've still got these two dorks, so what we're going to do is keep it nice and simple. Uh, you could technically, like, you're not warrior locked or anything by this stage. If you wanted to play, like, a Link 4, uh, I'm probably going to end up cutting Cross Sheep for, like, Salamangra Phoenix or something like that. I think Phoenix would make this board uh, probably even better. But the Ferocious Flame Swordsman does boost up your field by 500 attack points, which is kind of nice. Uh, because who doesn't like more attack points, right? So, we uh, brings up our Ultimate Flame Swordsman up to 3300. Uh, then our Salamandra comes back from the graveyard, equipping onto your guy, giving him an additional 700 and making his effect a quick effect. We also have the Gear Blade, uh, which you can, we can equip on the one of our guys if we wanted to, or you can hold on to it for the next turn, either or. Uh, but yeah, this is basically the... It's very, very similar board because we still have our one pop off of the Ultimate Flame Swordsman, but we also have our Promethean Princess in Grave, as well as follow up in the form of Augear um, to sort of fall back on for the next turn. So that's a small, small, small small snippet 
of how these two decks interact. Uh, now what I want to do is show off how Sublimation Knight can enable your actual uh, full Infernoble board. Alrighty, so it is worth bearing in mind that this version of the combo is essentially possible with any two warriors on field. Now, uh, the Sublimation Knight is one of the one card methods of getting there. Uh, there are others that we're not playing in the deck. For example, the uh, Neospace Connector is a very popular one in regular um, regular Infernoble. Uh, and there's definitely room for it here, I would say. It's a lot of normal summons, but I would say you could definitely squeeze it in. Uh, we're preferring Sublimation Knight because it's a Fire Warrior, and for reasons I'll get into when we get to the end of the video. Uh, you could also, I've seen a pretty cool Terror Top line. I, I made a video forever ago with like a Terror Top into MX Saber Invoker. Um, little package that can easily put out an Isold that also works in this deck without taking up your normal summon, which is nice. I may experiment with that in the future. It does add a couple of bricks, uh, but I do like having additional non-normal summon based starters. That is kind of my jam. So this is possible with essentially any two warriors on board. So let's get into it. Uh, we are going to start, of course, first and foremost with our Sublimation Knight. This is how we're getting our two, uh, two warriors on board. We're going to play our Squeak Knight. Uh, from hand, like I said, I seem to draw it a lot. Uh, we're going to special summon at the Squeak Knight. Now, not using its effect, we're going to go for the Isold. I sold? Sold? Sold day? I don't know. I feel like I pronounce it differently every time I say it. Uh, so we're going to use this effect here. We're going to grab uh, follow up. I like grabbing the Fire Flint Lady just because it's a nice thing to have on the clapback. Uh, now we're going to go for a sold second effect, the main effect. We're going to be milling four. We're going to send Uno, Dos, Tres, and Quattro. You need to send these two for this combo. Joyce and Durendal. You also need an equip in hand to make this work. Uh, ideally, not Almius. You need to preserve Almius. Uh, so Phoenix Gearblade is very useful for that purpose. You can also play the uh, Bamboo Package if you want. Uh, the Bamboo Package does put additional equips in Grave for you to banish off a Gear Freak later, which is nice. I personally prefer this one, though. Just less bricks. Now we're going to Special Summon the Augur. I'll go into more detail on all that at the end. Uh, Augur is going to activate its effect. We're going to be milling a card, and the Gear Blade is going to be adding itself from the Graveyard back to our hand. Again, the equip is going to be vital uh, for this version of the combo, and you're going to see why in just a second. We're going to send our Turpin to the graveyard. Now we're going to immediately equip on the um, we're going to equip on the Gear Blade to our Augur. We need a Fire Warrior that's equipped with an equip spell, because then Turpin will be able to bring itself back from the graveyard a little bit earlier than in most combos. Uh, but you'll see why we're doing it in just a second. Now we've got two level fours on the field. We're going to be going in to the Noble Knight King Artorigus. Uh, so our Torigus here is going to be integral in making sure we can get access to Ricardo. And this is kind of where I was floundering a lot on stream. Uh, if you were to watch the stream back, you'll notice a lot of times where I didn't really know where to go. This would have fixed that problem. Uh, so our Torigus is basically going to be equipping onto itself the two equip spells from the graveyard. And this is why we needed to send these two specifically. Because Durendal is going to be using its effect to search our deck for Ricardo. Adding it to our hand. Here it is here. And now we're going to be using these two as Link Material to go into our Promethean Princess. And the reason that is important is the equip spell Joyce that he was equipped with when sent to the graveyard, because the monster it was equipped to it was sent to the graveyard, uh, allows you to special summon a Fire Warrior from your hand. So we're going to special summon the Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo then going to bring back any level 4 non-tuner from our graveyard. It really doesn't matter which. Again, this is the moment where you would work the the Flame Swordsman cards in, but I'm going to do one more combo after that, discussing that specifically. Uh, now we've got these two dorks. We're going to be going in to our Angelica. Angelica then summoning herself out to the field. Uh, now we're going to use the... Uh, we'll use our effect, of course, to search for Museum. Museum is a soft once per turn, so if you're playing more equips than I am, uh, and you run multiple copies of Museum, you can absolutely take advantage of that. Uh, so we're going to go Turpin here. We're going to be targeting Angelica uh, to equip itself on. Angelica is going to bounce off the field in response. And she's going to do two things. We're going to mill a Fire Warrior from our deck to the graveyard. We're going to send our Immortal Phoenix Gearfried. And then we're going to be summoning the Infernoble Captain Roland uh, from our extra deck. So out he comes. Uh, of course, that guy fizzles. Now we're going to use the Promethean Princess. Promethean Princess is going to grab back uh, another level 4 non-tuner. Again, it doesn't really matter which, because all we need to do is Synchro Summon. 
Beautiful. Uh, now we're going to bring out the Charles here. Uh, so Charles, we're going to equip with Roland from our graveyard. Uh, so we're going to target the Charles here. We're going to equip on the Roland. Uh, not going to use its effect just yet. We're going to be going uh, with our Charles into the um, Emperor Charles the Great, which is basically a card that maintains all of the abilities of Charles while also being a soft once per turn spell or trap card negate. So this guy is awesome. Having a spell trap negate like back row negation in this format is fucking amazing. Uh, now we're going to equip on, of course, a card from our graveyard. We're going to grab the uh, Charles. Uh, what we're going to do, <laughs> I was supposed to equip this on the Emperor Charles, but it's okay. Uh, this works out anyways. So we're going to be activating our All Mace. We'll be equipping it onto the Promethean Princess. Uh, that's going to trigger Charles to basically pop the Promethean Princess. So we were supposed to do that sort of the other way around. Uh, All Mace then going to activate its effect. We're going to be grabbing back Gear Freed from our graveyard. Uh, now we're going to be going for the Museum. Uh, museum then going to activate its effect. We're going to pay 1200 life points. We're going to grab the last remaining copy of the Rendall. The Rendall itself doesn't actually matter, but now that we have used this card's effect, we can use its second effect to summon out Charles from our back row. So out the big man comes. Beautiful. Uh, now we're going to equip Charles with something. We'll equip him with Augier. It really doesn't matter. He just needs to be equipped with something. It could be the card we searched for, for example. It could be anything. It really doesn't matter because we're just using it to go into a second copy of the Link 1, uh, which is the Emperor Charles the Great. We're using both of these guys. Uh, he's going to equip on the Charles once more from the graveyard. Copying all of its effects and getting an additional 500 attack points. And now what we're going to be doing is Gear Freed, banishing any equip spell from our graveyard. As long as it's not Angelic Ring, it really doesn't matter. Uh, so I'm going to banish a copy of the Rendall because we, we have a second one in hand. So... Uh, if we need to recycle the rest later off of our Tauragus, we can. So what happens with this board then is during the end phase of this turn, um, we're going to be equipping a whole bunch of cards. So during the end phase, uh, Angelica first and foremost is going to come back to the field. And then we're going to be activating the effect of, of Charles the Great. We have to activate the effect of the one that is currently equipped with something. Make sure it's the one that still has a, a equip. It doesn't matter what, but it has to be equipped with something because you're going to be using Angelic Ring from your graveyard, which is an additional spell negate, as well as then having the opportunity to grab an extra fire warrior from deck and equip it on. We're going to equip on our extra Augier, and that makes our uh, Charles indestructible. So what essentially is going on right now? Well, we have a total of, what is this, five interruptions, six interruptions? So we have a mandatory spell negate. Angelic Ring will negate the first spell card your opponent plays during a turn. Uh, mandatory effect. Uh, the Charles, both Charles, uh, are spell trap negates. You can use both. It's a soft once per turn, so both can be used. So that's three, um, well, two spell trap negates and one spell negate. We have Gear Freed, which can send a card to the graveyard, uh, an equipped card to the graveyard to negate a monster effect. So there's four direct interruptions. And we have Roland from Graveyard. And the reason Roland from Graveyard is a interruption is because when uh, your Charles becomes equipped with a card, like Roland's Quick Play effect to equip itself from the graveyard, uh, you then get to pop a card. So we have two spell trap negates, a spell negate, a monster to get and destroy, and a pop a card on demand. Five interruptions all coming from effectively putting any two warrior monsters onto your board. Sublimation Knight, uh, Neospace Connector, and Terror Top all being good ways of doing it in one card combo methods, but any other combination of two cards, like a Fire Warrior Normal Summon plus Fire Flint Lady, Renaud, whatever, also gets you this. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because the ceiling of this deck Caps whenever you're looking at two card combinations between uh, the Fighting Flame Swordsman and a Extender. Fire Flint Lady, Renaud, whatever, right? An Extender. Uh, so I'm going to shoot that off as our last combo before we get into the gameplay. All right. Uh, now, this is an example of such a hand where we have our Fighting Flame Swordsman as well as Renaud. Now, do bear in mind that there are uh, plenty of ways of looking at this combo, and they don't always come from Fighting Flame Swordsman in hand plus X. This could also be Augur uh, plus an additional way to get the Turpin. Maybe Augur and Turpin in hand. Maybe Augur, Fire Flint, Turpin. It, there's a few ways in which it can happen. So long as by the end of the Isold step, uh, you have a few things that are true. Uh, and I'll be discussing what those things are in just a second. Uh, but the most straightforward way of thinking about it is just 
Fading Fleam plus X Extender in hand. Uh, so we're going to start with that. We are, of course, going to normal summon our Fading Flame Swordsman. We're going to activate its effect to search our deck for a card. We're going to grab the Flame Sword Drill. So Flame Sword Drill element is in hand. Uh, now what we're going to be doing is special summoning at Renaud. Now Renaud is, of course, a tuner in this scenario, but we're going to treat it like it's any generic Warrior Extender, and we're going to be going into Isolde. So we're going to use these two here. We're going to summon out Isolde. Uh, now remember, we do get to search our deck for a card. We are going to use her effect as Chain Link 2. Uh, the main sort of benefit of this effect is unironically, not only A, getting a body for Swords Realm, uh, but B, primarily chain blocking our Fading Flame Swordsman, which is kind of nice because this effect is ass. Uh, it's not a good effect. <laughs> uh, let's grab uh, Fire Flint. Why not? I always grab Fire Flint, uh, just because, I don't know, it's a force of habit at this point. Uh, there may be better targets, maybe I'm not thinking of them, but like, because you can't use the card at all, uh, maybe maybe we need to like look for a Fire Warrior that's good in Grave. I, uh, I don't know. Anyways, uh, we are going to grab our Salamandra Equip spell, just like before in the regular uh, Salamandra line. Now we're going to go for Isold. Uh, we're going to mill out, so you can either mill 4 or 1 here. If you mill one to go into Ricardo, you're going to bring back Defending Flame Swordsman and do basically everything anyways. Uh, so that is usually um, just as good a way to go about it as any. You could also do the Turpin line here, which is what I'm going to do. So in the gameplay, I do the Send 1 for Ricardo line. Uh, here, I'm going to show off this line. So you're going to see both in this video. Uh, and I want you to get a good idea as to both. Because doing it this way is nice. Because not only do you get the gear blade. But you also get the angelic ring engrave. And that is the big difference. The big difference is doing it this way. Guarantees you the angelic ring. Which is really, really good. Uh, so we're going to summon out the Og gear. Uh, this is A-OK. -okay. We're going to go Og gear. Chain link 1. Gear blade. Chain link 2. Yup, yup, yup. Gear blade back to hand. Uh, look at the size of our hand by the way. What the hell? And then we're going to send the Turpin to the graveyard. Turpin being a grave. So basically by this stage, um, so long as Turpin is in grave and you have the Sword Realm in hand, 99% of circumstances, you can make the full end board from this position uh, with a level 4 Fire Warrior, Sword Realm, and Turpin in grave. You can make the play happen from here, right? Um, so... We're going to continue up with this particular circumstance. Uh, we are going to go along with the um, Artorigus line. Just because it's, it is different from what I was doing in the gameplay. So I would like you to see both sides of the coin here. Uh, now we're going to go for Turpin. Uh, Turpin is going to special summon itself. Yep. Out it comes. Now we're going to go Artorigus. Yep. Bang, bang. Our Torgus then going to activate its effects. We're going to grab these. And the reason, another reason this version of the combo is better is you get access to uh, Promethean Princess, which you otherwise wouldn't because you'd be warrior locked by Ricardo on its summon. Uh, so this way you also get access to the Promethean Princess, which is a nice little addition to the end board for sure. Uh, not, you know, totally game breaking or anything, but definitely very nice. Uh, so we're going to grab the uh, Ricardo here. Now, just like before, we're going to go link three into our Promethean Princess. Just like this. Uh, that's going to trigger our Joyce. Joyce then going to grab us back the... Or sorry, going to special summon the Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo then going to activate its effect to bring back a level 4 um, warrior monster. It really doesn't matter which of these you choose. Uh, so we're going to target the Fading Flame Swordsman because he's the coolest, in my opinion. <laughs> as valid a reason to play a card as any. Uh, so now we're going to go for Angelica... Uh, do summon it in defense, because when it comes back to the field, it will come back in the position in which it was summoned. Uh, so we're going to use the effect of Angelica. Angelica then is going to grab his museum. Beautiful. Uh, now we're going to use the Promethean Princess to bring back our level 4 uh, non-tuner. So we're going to bring back... Um... Oh, sorry. No. Oh, Yeah, so <laughs> I've done this in a sl slightly incorrect order, but it's okay. Uh, sorry, we were supposed to use Turpin next to target the uh, Angelica. Luckily, those two steps don't have to come in order. So if you do make that mistake, don't worry about it. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, <laughs> so Angelica is now going to bounce off the field to dodge Turpin's targeting. We're going to send the gear freed to the graveyard, just like normal. Uh, we are going to special summon out the Roland, just like normal. 
Uh, there's our level 5 tuner, Turp and Fizzles, and we've got our level 5 and our level 4, which is where we would have ended up anyways, so no harm, no foul. Now we're going to use these two. Uh, we're going to be going into our Charles. Big Charles, right here. Uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to use our Noble Arms Museum. Uh, we're going to activate the museum. Uh, we're going to grab the Almus uh, directly from our deck. Now you don't the, again the, the specific order of these next few steps isn't all that important all of the time. So if you get something slightly out of sequence, don't like don't worry too much about it. it it's okay. It's okay. You'll survive. Uh, so we're gonna go Charles now into the back row. Uh, sorry, roll into the back row underneath Charles so we can uh, link one. So we're gonna go into Emperor Charles the Great. Emperor Charles the Great gonna activate its effect. We're gonna equip onto him Charles from our graveyard. Uh, yep, we're not using your effect just yet. Now we're gonna go for the Noble Arms Museum. We're gonna summon fourth Charles out to the field. Beautiful. Uh, we are now going to equip onto him uh, the Salamandra. There we are, beautiful. So now we're going to equip the Almus, just like before. The Almus gets equipped onto the Promethea. Uh, again, the specific ordering of none, none of this actually fucking matters. Um, so the Almus onto the Promethean. Uh, that triggers our pop effect, so we can use the pop to get rid of the Promethean. Uh, triggering the Almus to bring back our Gear Freed. Now, uh, we do need rid of the Promethean so we can free up the extra monster zone so we can go into our second Charles. That's the main sort of issue there and why you actually need to do that. Uh, so you might as well get a gear freed out of it while you're at it. Uh, so now we're going to use your effect. You're going to summon out Charles here. Beautiful. Uh, now, we're going to go gear freed. Gear freed, of course, is going to banish, uh, say, Durendal from our graveyard. Any equip, it doesn't matter so long as it's not one of your important ones. Now, this is, uh, again, this is kind of where we ended last time, but we've got a couple more plays we're going to make this time. Uh, we do have the Sal uh, Sword Drillum, and we have a Fire Warrior that we searched for earlier in our turn. Uh, we searched for this flat Fire Flint Lady. So we're going to drop the Fire Flint Lady, and we're going to summon out the Flame Swordsman from our extra deck. Uh, now we're going to equip onto the Flame Swordsman our Salamandra Fusion. And now we're using the Salamandra Fusion... Uh, to send both into the ultimate flame swordsman right here beautiful 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 and just like that we're going to uh we are going to equip a card onto our big guy just so that his effect is a quick effect so now he's got a quick effect pop and he's indestructible um it is a little bit awkward you don't really want to set call by here because you do want um two equip slots free you can though the equip a fire from monster. Uh, the the equip a fire monster from deck effect isn't really all that important. Uh, so we are going to end our turn. That's going to trigger our Charles here again. Make sure that you're using the effect of a Charles that is equipped with a card, uh, because you specifically want to equip Angelic Ring. Uh, then Angelica herself comes back, and there you go. Uh, so just like that, by having our fading flame swordsman plus a extender of any description any extender whatsoever yeah i don't really care about you right now any extender we're able to tack onto our end board an additional uh, quick play pop and indestructible huge body that can generate crazy lethal damage and another really important thing to note about this is the flame swords realm uh, I'm going to talk more about this during the gameplay because it does come up and win us some games. But effectively, whenever one of your monsters battles, uh, your fire warriors battles, you can target any monster uh, on your field, any warrior monster on your field. You can reduce that monster's attack points by a thousand and all of your other monsters gain a thousand. And that's soft once per turn. So if you have multiple swords realms, you can boost to multiple times. Uh, so if they were to, for example, attack my um, ultimate flame swordsman with a 3500 attack point monster, um, yeah, you're negated. If they were to somehow do that, then I would be able to protect him and boost him up to 4,300 by reducing, say, Angelica's attack points down to 700. Uh, so we're protected. So we have two spell trap negates. We have a spell negate, a monster negate, a free pop, uh, and a second free pop. So it's six total interruptions off of this board, uh, plus just insane levels of follow-up. It really is... It really is incredible. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, this this may be my favorite deck. It may be. 
Uh, I'm going to show off some gameplay. I'm going to go through the deck list at the end uh, that I'm currently playing and that I was playing on stream. And I'm also going to talk about a few ideas as the alternative ways of building it that I've been sort of thinking up in the background. Alrighty, so let's get started. Yes, we were playing on the live twin fields because this shit is cool as hell. I didn't actually know I have music until after the stream. Uh, so here's an example of our whole, like, any two warriors uh, idea. I do think we do the line differently here, and that's why I wanted to show off the Artorgus line before. Uh, so we're going to go these two into Isolde. Uh, so Isolde is going to use her effect. We're going to search our deck for Oliver. Like I said, we were playing Oliver at the time. We ended up cutting it because it wasn't doing much. We're going to mill four. We're going to summon out the Augur. Augur going to activate its effect to send the Fighting Flame Swordsman. Fighting Flame Swordsman going to activate send Salamandra. Uh, now we're going to send the... Um, is sold off of the Dia Bellstar. For those confused, I already have the fusion in hand and I was not playing the chain at the time. Uh, we're going to go Dia Bellstar into your original Sinful Spoils, original Sinful Spoils, sending uh, the Dia Bellstar, summoning Ricardo directly from the deck. Yet another way of going about generating the line. Uh, if you have this position and you really want to go into the Fighting Flame Swordsman stuff and you have no trace of it in hand, you can do it this way if you have Dia Bellstar. Dia Bellstar is awesome like that. Uh, so now we're going to go into our Fighting Flame Swordsman. Fighting Flame Swordsman going to be bot boosted up before being sent to the graveyard for our ultimate Flame Swordsman. Now we still have the ability to Synchro Summon into Angelica, the noble... Uh, the Princess of Noble Arms are going to use our effect to grab our museum. Uh, now Salamandra is going to target the Angelica, uh, allowing her to bounce off the field. Salamandra can, of course, be used uh, to proc the Angelica, which is fucking dope. Uh, we're going to go for the Roland here. Uh, museum then going to be activated. We're going to go into Infernoble Knight Emperor Charles. We're going to use its effect, sorry, Roland's effect to equip onto it. So we can go Link 1 into Emperor Charles the Great. Emperor Charles the Great then going to equip onto itself to Charles from the Graveyard. Uh, our gear then going to be equipped onto our uh, monster and we decide to pass just like that. We could potentially have gone into a second... Uh, uh, maybe I couldn't, maybe I didn't have enough equips actually. Uh, we could potentially have gone into a second Great Charles there. I don't know why we didn't. Uh, again, this was early days of the live stream, so... Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, this was embarrassing. Yeah, Tenpai. Tenpai getting absolutely cooked. Angelic Ring getting the Lightning Storm. Charles the Great saying no to the field spell. Uh, and then the last card in hand uh, they're going to play is the Chundra. Uh, we don't pop the Chundra on summon. We allowed to summon the resolve and we waited until he went start of battle phase. And then we decided to pop. Uh, and that's going to be how you want to counter the Chundra when playing against Tenpai. Uh, you want to remove as many opportunities. They have to act as humanly possible. Uh, but ultimately, that was pretty sick. Very, very clean shutdown of Tempai. We could definitely have put an extra spell trap to get up there. I'm pretty sure we were just sort of experimenting with the deck at the time and, and didn't see the line for two. But that was still absolutely incredible. Super straightforward, just like the combos. Let's keep going. Already getting in your second replay. What do we got with this hand? We got the Fighting Flame Swordsman plus Dia Bellstar. Interesting. Gonna get Ashed on the summon of the Swordsman. That does hurt, because uh, that does stop us from grabbing the Swords Realm, which does kind of kill the Fighting Flame Swordsman play just a little bit. Uh, Dia Bellstar then gonna be coming out, sending our Swordsman to the grave, uh, using at the very least its graveyard effect to net us just a little bit of advantage so we don't have to do nearly as much searching on the follow-up turn if we want to go into those plays. Uh, Salamandra then grabbing us the equip spell from our deck. We have every... That's right. This game, I believe, uh, was a real problem because I think I drew, like, every fucking equip spell in my deck. Because <laughs> uh, I don't believe at this stage we were playing the Gear Blade, which was really annoying. Uh, we're going to go Angelica, Princess of Noble Arms. Going to grab the Museum, activating the Museum. Uh, we're going to go Salamandra to trigger the Angelica. That is honestly the biggest use of the... Salamandra that I found so far. Uh, we're going to go into Roland, then that's going to fizzle, of course. Dorendal targeting the Roland. We're going to go Turpin now, summoning itself back from the graveyard. Dorendal going to activate, grabbing us Renaud directly from the deck that I have. We're now going to go into the Infernoble Emperor Charles. Charles then going to be equipped with our um, equip spell here. We're going to go Museum, grabbing ourselves our Dorendal. I guess I'm a liar. We had another Dorendal in our deck. Nice. Emperor Charles the Great. Uh, is going to be summoned, equipping onto itself Charles from the graveyard. We're going to recycle back the uh, Turpin from the Banish Pile because we do want to use this card later on in the duel if possible. We don't want that shit to be banished. We're going to go Museum to summon back the Charles from our back row. Uh, we're going to equip it with Roland now from our graveyard, enabling the summoning of a second Emperor Charles the Great. 
Uh, Emperor Charles the Great then going to target the Charles and Graveyard one more time. We're going to bring back Angelica. Now we're going to go Charles here. Uh, being met with Torby. Torby sending two to set a Labyrinth uh, back row card, which was a very poor decision from our opponent. Um, because number no, number one, not only are we playing anti-spell trap the deck, he does set it during the end phase in a position where we can still pop it. So poor timing from our opponent, and really a horrible, horrible matchup into Infernoble. Even though he only banished three, fuck it. Like he's got three cards in hand. I've got two spell trapping against. There's nothing that Labyrinth can do in this spot. This is game over. Normal summons the Ash Blossom. I'm pretty sure this was just an attempt at Seppuku here. Uh, because he just decides that that's going to be it. And I'm fairly certain we just go for lethal here. Uh, so yes, again, still finding use for the Fighting Flame Swordsman cards, even in a situation where you don't go directly into the Ultimate Flame Swordsman. Uh, you can still use su things such as the Salamandra in order to, to trigger the Angelica, and ultimately fur for your Infernoble board. Again, very straightforward. Lab stands absolutely no chance. So if you're someone who's frustrated by Labyrinth, this is the deck for you. Alrighty, and getting into our uh, next replay, we're gonna go Vishyude here. That's right, this guy was playing just regular old Sword Soul. Uh, refreshing take, nice to see Sword Soul getting some action. Um, Tenyi is gonna be getting some major support in the OCG very soon. I've seen the new Tenyi support and it looks absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so hopefully Sword Soul is going to be seeing a little bit of love from Konami in the not-so-distant future. Now I'm going to banish free for the Protos. They've got that Omni Monster to get and Protos Call Dark. That means no DFL Star for us. That really doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to go Heritage of the Chalice. Going to try essentially intimidating the Baron into using its effect here. Uh, we're going to target the Baron using the Durendal. We're going to grab the Fire Flintly. He doesn't take the bait. Uh, we're going to go Immortal Phoenix Gear Free. We're going to banish the Durendal. Can I hit us on Maxi? That's why he was so confident here. We're going to go cross out onto the Maxi, but of course he's going to Baron to get the cross out because it's Maxi, right? He doesn't want their Maxi to resolve. So that is very annoying, and it is ultimately the crux of what keeps this Sword Soul player in this game. Uh, he is going to draw a card off of our Gear Freak getting summoned. I'm going to normal summon the Fighting Flame Swordsman to beat out the Grand Master. Again, this was, <laughs> this was a pretty funny moment from the stream because I'm pretty sure this guy totally forgot that Gear Freak has text on it. Uh, we're essentially going to go Battle Fiends, swinging into the Baron, stealing the Grand Master and boosting ourselves up by 500. So we're big enough to get rid of the Baron. And just like that, he's two Synchro Monsters down off of one attack. He got to draw one card. We have a monster. And again, he's going to go Protoss Call Fire. I'm going to send his Grandmaster back to his graveyard to negate that effect. The Protoss, of course, is not destroyed because it's indestructible by card effects. Uh, but ultimately, even though he drew two cards from his deck, he does not have any plays. Into my turn again, we're going to go the, for the Fading Flame Sword. Being met with an Ash Blossom, that kind of sucks, but you know, it is what it is, I guess. We have plenty of gas on our hand to continue playing the game. I'm not going to worry too much about that. We're going to Normal Summon our Augear. Augear then going to Mill Turpin, activating the Fire Flint Lady's Special Summon, and it comes another Max C. Royal this time. I have to say, I'm I'm definitely in control of this game. I'm not going to lose control of this game because I get nibbed off of a maxi. I'm going to chill. I'm going to steal the Protos. I'm going to get my licks in, and I'm simply going to pass. There's no way that a Sword Soul player can draw a card good enough to out this board. He's going to go Ecclesia into Ecclesia to go Chakanane. Chakanane then ranking up into the Zodiac. Borbo, Borbo into the battle. He is attacking directly. I have never before seen a Zeus lane in Sword Soul, but today was the day, apparently. He's going to detach two, we're going to negate and destroy, of course, to clear out the Zeus, but he's going to chain it again to wipe the field for real this time. Uh, so we do actually have our board broken. I was really surprised by that. So he's going to wipe the field. Hell night. That, that, our opponent kind of can of game it. I don't know, double maxi. I don't know if I call it double maxi gaming, but you know, it's pretty, pretty cool. I uh, gotta grab the Salamander Fusion here during our opponent's same phase. We're looking a little dicey, but we're still technically in control of this game. Uh, drawing into the Sublimation Knight was the play that we needed. We're gonna play the Squeak Knight from the hand. Still pretty low on advantage, but you're gonna see how well this deck can come back from the gutter if you're able to preserve some of your extra deck resources. Sometimes it's worth not going balls to the wall, uh, just so you can keep things like your Isolde in your extra deck to fall back on at later turns in duel. Uh, we're gonna go for our Ricardo and our 
Gear Blade. Gear Blade again is going to activate its effect, returning back to our hand. Ricardo then going to bring back the Fading Flame Swords for Grave, activating to search our deck for these swords. Realm, we're going to go for the Realm. Uh, now we're going to Synchro Summon into Angelica. Angelica then going to activate, grabbing us our Museum. Fading Flame Swordsman going to activate, grabbing us... Uh, or sorry, it's Milling. We were playing the Mirage Swordsman at this stage. Um, we're, yeah. We were playing this guy. If you want to play this guy, you can. He's pretty funny sometimes. But that's about it. He's just kind of funny sometimes. Uh, I really fucking love the look of this card. And he seems so cool. And there's definitely, like, room for him. If you really wanted to play him. But fuck me, the list is tight, man. It's tight, tight, tight. Uh, so that is fine. We're going to go Turpin onto our Angelica, just like in uh, the combo guides. Uh, we're going to mill the odd gear directly uh, from the deck. We're going to go roll in then. Turpin is going to fizzle, of course, because it no, its target's no longer on the field. Uh, Turpin coming back from the grave, the Synchro Summon with our Roland into the Infernoble Knight Emperor Charles, and we're simply not going to BM. No reason to drag this duel out any longer than needed. We're simply going to take our win. The Zeus line in Swordsoul is a fucking... Phew, he got me with that one. That was pretty That was pretty funny. Uh, not enough to win in the game, but he was, they, they came down close. It was a solid play. All right, and this was uh, the last replay and one of the more recent ones. We're going to go Sublimation Knight uh, into the Swick Knight. Uh, I believe this is the other version of the Isol combo that I did not show earlier. We're going to go Assault Hay here. We're going to grab the Fire Flint Lady as per usual. Well, we're going to go Assault. We're going to uh, pitch four uh, to summon the Augier. Augier then going to activate its effect alongside the Gear Blade. So that is a okay. Gear Blade gonna add itself to our hand. Our gear then gonna send the Fading Flame Swordsman. Fading Flame Swordsman gonna activate its effect, milling the Salamandra. Salamandra then activating the grab our fusion spell. Uh, now we're gonna link up into our Promethean Princess, the Bestower of Flames. Bestower of Flames gonna activate to bring back the Fading Flame Swordsman. Swordsman then activating its effect to grab the Fading Flame Sword. We're gonna go with Sword Realm. Sword Realm activating to pitch the Fire Flint Lane that we searched for to go into our Flame Swordsman. Uh, Flame Swordsman then being equipped with Salamandra Fusion. Uh, so we can send both to the graveyard to go into our ultimate Flame Swordsman. Uh, now we're going to use these two to go into our Ferocious Flame Swordsman. And this is, yes, this was our first combo, combo number one. Uh, I didn't have anything left to search off of that. Definitely should have just kept it for the targeting protection. Uh, but I forgot the trap card doesn't actually mention uh, the Flame Swordsman by name. Uh, we're going to equip on a few cards to our Flame Swordsman here. We're going to make them indestructible and bigger. Uh, they're going to go Called by the Grave to get rid of the Promethean Princess. Totally reasonable. Uh, I think that's that's a fine play by them. Trap Tricks Mantis. We're going to hit him with the Max C here, of course. Um, definitely an early Called by there. Mm, I don't know if I would have went Called by quite that quickly. Um, he's going to go Triple Tactics Thrust. We're going to use Ash to stop that Thrust. Um, he's going to make a bit of an interesting play here. Which I thought was was curious. Um, he's going to go into Typhon. Uh, Typhon off the Mantis. I guess playing around the Maxi as much as possible while also trying to break the board. He does manage to out our board here because Typhon doesn't target. Fun fact. Typhon doesn't target. So, uh, Which is a bit of a pain. I know Augur doesn't protect us from targeting and protect us from destruction, but... Uh, I didn't know the Typhoon didn't target. Bit unrelated, but you know what I mean. Uh, you're gonna build the Turpin, at least getting us some sort of advantage back from that battle into our turn. Setting three! Suddenly we're not in a fantastic spot. We're gonna go the Fading Flame Swordsman, grabbing another copy of the Fading Flame Sword. Into the original Sinful Spoils, pitch one. Gonna be met with Dimensional Barrier, stopping us from summoning fusion monsters. Our opponent kinda missed the mark on that one. We have no intention of at this point summoning any additional fusion monsters, at least not more than we've already used. Turpin then coming back from the grave so we can go into uh, Artorigus. Artorigus, of course, not only a phenomenal engine piece, but also being an excellent way of clearing out back row decks. Artorigus, pop two, wipes his back row, and then we can very easily combo in the game from there. Our opponent had no intention of sitting around and finding out what came after Artorigus. Simple as that. Alrighty, so this is the deck list. Now, this list in particular is focusing more on ensuring we're not sacrificing any um, of the tactics that Infernoble usually bring to the table. There's a couple of different ways in which you can build this deck that I do want to briefly reference. Uh, I might make content on, on them in the future. They're not different enough, in my opinion, to sort of warrant their own videos. Uh, but there's a few ways of looking at this once you understand the philosophy of the deck and what it, it is you're actually looking for. 
Uh, so first things first, we're just going to go through the list. There's not really all that much non-engine, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. Uh, so I'm going to go through sort of like engine at a time rather than card at a time. Uh, we're going to start off with the Squeak Knight and the Sublimation Knight. Sublimation Knight of 3, of course. Uh, this is kind of like your only true one card normal summon starter. Uh, and I don't even really like it all that much. <laughs> I don't like playing the brick for it. Uh, the benefit of it being a finer warrior over, like, for example, the Neospace Connector, which I was playing in previous versions of Infernoble, is the fact that it's a fire warrior. And why does that matter? Well, the brand new card, Flame Swords Realm. So this card in particular is a huge buff to a lot of the consistency of Infernoble because your opponent cannot react to the normal summon of a Fire Warrior monster. Now, again, if they have hand traps, they can still use them later in your combo. It only protects a normal summon. So it's not, you know, totally 100% amazing, but it guarantees that you're able to at least generate some sort of a momentum at the beginning of your turn, uh, which could be just enough to outweigh uh, however, ha however many hand traps they may be carrying. So because of that, uh, playing Sublimation Knight as a Fire Warrior means that on summon, he can't be impermed, he can't be ogred, um, he just can't be hit, basically, in general. Uh, so th it is nice that the Sublimation Knight cannot be negated, because uh, it does add a, a little, little tiny bit of protection. It also, uh, the same also applies to Elgir and, and the Fighting Flame Swordsman, of course. Uh, so yeah, so you know the combo with these guys. Uh, Renaud and Fire Flint Lady. Uh, these two cards are basically going to be the biggest things that change from list to list. Because you're going to see a lot of people who are going to play this deck um, with like Fire Flint at 2 and Renaud at 2 or 3. Uh, and, and they're not wrong. They're not wrong for doing that. That is absolutely a very valid way of doing it. And it's ve honestly very... I'm very tempted to go that direction myself because looking back and you're sort of when you're seeing the deck and understanding the deck, trying to get away from this sort of fallacious concept of one card combos is is pretty important because that's not how this deck works. So trying to focus on it too heavily is going to lead you down a bad road, and you've got to have these types of guys, Fireflint and, and Renaud, uh, to help you back out of that. So Fireflint, Renaud, absolutely, I think are awesome cards and are likely going to see play at two or even three in not only other people's lists, but likely my list going forward. Uh, Ricardo was a one of, is kind of sort of very important for a lot of your combos. Uh, not great in the hand though, definitely just play about one. Triple Maxi, obviously. Uh, the one Salamandra, you do not need more than one of this card. This is a Foolish Burial target off of your Fighting Flame Swordsman. It also triggers if it's sent from anywhere else to the graveyard. So if you like discard it, or if you summon it and link it off, or whatever the situation may be, um, still plenty of ways of getting rid of it to trigger its effects. So that's absolutely fine. Uh, three Ash Blossom. Uh, we got double Augear and one Turpin as our only level four Infernobles. Now, why is that? To put simply, you don't need the other guys and they don't do a lot by themselves. So I really like having the versatility of being able to equip guys from the graveyard. Don't get me wrong. I like that. I like it a lot. Um, uh, but I was so seldom actually, I mean, I didn't have any problems with the cards though. Like you could definitely play the likes of Oliver if you really, really wanted to. Like there's no reason as to why you couldn't. Uh, let me bring up the other guys here. So we're gonna go related. Um, damn, why are you guys not showing up? Infernoble. So the other ones that people typically play uh, are Oliver, which is this guy, and the Ma uh, Magus which is this one. So both basically also have the effect while they're engraved to target a warrior and equip it onto the, to the warrior you control, which is very useful. Very useful effect because having names and bodies is absolutely nice. I, I But again, with a list like this, the Fading Flame Swordsman fills enough of that gap and hole to where you really don't need these extra names and sometimes they're just in the way. So I personally dropped them. I didn't find them so useful that I couldn't replace them with something else that does a similar job. Um, but, you know, take that as you will. Honestly, even the likes of Augear, I was very, very tempted to cut down to, to one. I was actually playing it at one during our live stream for a while. Uh, I just, I, I bumped it back up to two because I really wanted to have at least one in deck for uh, an Isolde line. Is, my, is the only reason I'm even playing this guy at two. Uh, Turpin, absolutely just a one, no matter what, is not a great card to see in hand. I mean, it's again, it's not terrible because you can discard it very easily, 
and it's useful in Grave, so it's not the worst thing in the world, but Algira at two at least. You could definitely play it at three if you want. Uh, it's not a true one card starter, but it's also not the worst card in the world, so take that as you will. Uh, Fading Flame Swordsman, again, uh, one card starter into your f uh, Flame Swordsman line, which isn't all that great, uh, but he is the crux of that line, which means if you have him plus any extender, like I showed you in combo number four, uh, he absolutely goes buck wild. So if, I think three of this guy, absolutely. And again, you're probably going to want to see lists playing less Infernoble stuff, uh, and they're probably going to drop a lot of this to go for like maybe a 40 card list that focuses on fighting flame swordsman plus extenders uh to focus on the two card combo aspect of the deck uh maybe even dropping the maybe even dropping the bell star entirely although I, I really like the bell star in this version but i can i can see a version where you cut it for sure yeah i can see a, a 40 card version of this deck that focuses on fighting flame swordsman plus extender rather than worrying about one card combos and, and fallback plans for sure uh so this guy is absolutely a free uh, Diabelle Star 3, Original Sinful Spoils, and Seeker of Sinful Spoils, both at 1. Uh, these guys are awesome for going into Ricardo, uh, which is a great recovery play. If you can have hand traps, it's a great starter. If you already have a Warrior in Grave, it's excellent follow-up. If you really sort of need to get back into the game after having a rough turn. So Diabelle Star does a lot for this deck, and I really do think you should be playing her. Uh, at least in this more Infernoble heavy version. Uh, one Gear Freed is mandatory, free-to-play card, so don't worry about it. Uh, we've got Rhoda, free-to-play card, which is sick. Grab anything you want. Uh, Heritage is basically just Rhoda for Noble Knights. It also lets you grab Noble Arms as well, like the Equip spells. So this card's really fucking good. I would play this at 3, for sure. Um, it is a hard once per turn, so you might want to play it at 2 if you're playing a 40-card 40, 40 kind. Uh, but we're playing, we're playing 50, so I think playing it at 3 is not uh, a big deal whatsoever. Uh, we've got double Durandal. Durandal's one of your better equips, and you really need to have the sort of critical mass of equip spells in your deck in order to make sure uh, you can resolve a soul day even if you draw one or two of them. Uh, so double up on Durandal was the way I looked at that. Uh, one Joyce and one All Miss. Both these cards are necessary for your combos. I guess if you wanted to, you could drop uh, a Durandal and go for double All Miss uh, to make the actual combo itself more consistent. But I do like having double Durandal. Uh, one Gear Blade, of course, one Angelic Ring, all part of our combo. Salamander Fusion, part of the combo. Museum uh, at three. You don't, you don't have to play Museum at three. It's good. Like, you absolutely need to play it as part of your combo. Um, it is soft once per turn, which is why I do like seeing it. Like, it's not, it's not terrible at three. Uh, but you burn through all of your equips so quickly that, like... Maybe it's actually not even worth playing it more than more than two. I think maybe even one you could get away with. Um, because, again, it's kind of... It's nice follow-up, I guess. But, no, you, you, you burn through all of your equip spells so quickly in this deck that you probably don't even need more than one museum, if I'm being honest. So if you if you were looking at certain cards and you wanted more room, let's say for like a fur dog gear, and you, or you really, really wanted to play Oliver or whatever... You could cut Museum down because anytime I see this card in hand, I never use it more than once. So I end up just searching for a second copy and then just having a dead card in hand. Kind of pointless. So if you were looking for space, you could probably cut Museum for some space. Uh, cut it down to one, I would say, is, is totally fine. Because it's not even like a... It's not an issue if you open up with it, right? It just means you're a card down. But in a, a 50-card deck... The odd occasion where that may happen, I think, is going to be outweighed by the number of times that I would have had a museum in hand, but instead drew a more useful card. I think that's definitely how that equation would work. Three copies of the Flame Sword Trellum. Again, this is a card you could absolutely play at one. If you play at one, I personally think you're a fucking idiot. Uh, I'm joking, but no, this card's really good. I love the normal summon protection. I appreciate that it's and maybe I'm overthinking it or overhyping it, but I, damn, it's just it feels really good when your opponent can't ash blossom your fighting swordsman, um, or can't ash blossom a augur or, or can't do any of that shit. It just it's just nice. Uh, I really like that. Uh, plus, having it in hand means that if they were to negate your fighting flame swordsman, because ash on this guy's summon effect kills the whole. Um, Flame Swordsman engine. So it does. 
Like, specifically on the summon effect. If they ash that and you don't have Sword Realm already, then you're cooked, right? You can't go into your ultimate flame swordsman. So running three copies of it makes you a little bit more, more resilient to hand traps because you no longer rely as heavily on the search. You're simply more likely to just open up a copy of it, which puts you in the lead with that engine already. So I definitely like three copies for sure. Uh, and also it's it's Bob boost effect, the attack fuse, like the attack boost effect. There are certain games I only won because I had multiple copies of this on field because that effect is a soft once per turn. There are duels I only won by having two copies of this card in the field, being able to boost up my field by 2k attack points during the battle phase um, absolutely saved me more than once. So that is another reason as to why I like this card as multiples. I do appreciate you're playing an equip spell based deck, which means your back row is going to be very, very tight. So do bear that in mind. Uh, ultimately, it is personal preference, but I just wanted to tell you why I'm playing what I'm playing. Uh, double call by one cross it just for anti maxi. Seeker we've already talked about. Uh, Fading Flame Sword is basically just like Rota for your Flame Swordsman package. It grabs you um, any card that mentions Flame Swordsman from deck to hand. That's your Sword Realm. That's your Fading Flame Swordsman. That's your, I believe it, this card also mentions it. Yep, it can also grab you the fusion. So if any part of your combo gets interrupted or if you don't open up any part of your combo, uh, this card's got your back. Uh, it also has interruption based effects. So if your opponent targets a card or um, targets a card on your field that mentions Flame Swordsman or is Flame Swordsman, you can negate that effect. So targeting protection is nice. And when an attack is declared involving a fire warrior you control, you can target a card in the field. Destroy it. So nice way of getting rid of floodgates in particular. This card's nice at sniping floodgates with that effect. So definitely worth bearing in mind. So it's interruption, aggression, floodgate removal, and consistency. There is zero reason to not play this at three. And lastly, a Salamander with Chain. I kind of like the idea of this card. I'm still 50-50 on it. Uh, I don't like that it doesn't say Flame Swordsman in its text. Like, that honestly is, is putting me off this card. If this card said Flame Swordsman in its text and was thus searchable off of Fading Flame Sword, I would be so much more comfortable with it. But it doesn't, and it's really putting me off. It's a really good card, though. So basically, you can target a Fire Monster uh, on the field, equip this card to it as an equip card, gain 700 attack points, and then you can flip an Effect Monster on the field face down. So it's Book of Moon, which is nice. Uh, and, and it can also banish itself from the graveyard to conduct a fusion summon for one of your Flame Swordsman cards. Uh, which is, again, a really cool in theory. Uh, but the only way to make that fusion effect relevant is if I were to, like, if I were to play two of him. If I doubled up on the ultimate Flame Swordsman, the fusion effect becomes relevant. Until then, it, it's only relevant when I, like, I, I want specifically when I recycle ultimate Flame Swordsman off of all Mace's effect. That, it's... No, I'm good. Uh, it's so much easier to just recycle them back to field off of, like, fucking Promethean. Like, I don't know why I would need to go through all of that fuck shit just to do that. So, if you wanted to play this guy at 2, then yes, I would say this card is, is suddenly becomes a lot better. Um, I'm mainly using it for its book effect, but I'm, I would be a liar if I said it has come up even a single time since I put it on my deck. Um, so, take that with a pinch of salt, do what you will with that. Uh, into the extra deck. This is where things are a little bit dicey because it ultimately, some of it depends on your main deck. Um, some of these I was just experimenting with, like Cross Sheep. I was experimenting with Cross Sheep. I think this card's ass. I'm taking it out. <laughs> it's just bad. It's like it's neat in some like really super obscure Apo lines, um, but I, I think I just think those lines are bad. I just don't think they're worth giving up my extra deck space to account for. I kind of want to lean more heavily into what this deck wants to do, and what this deck wants to do is beat ass. So I'm really tempted to just play the uh, Raging Phoenix instead. I would absolutely just play Raging Phoenix over Cross Sheep here. But anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, one Flame Swordsman is absolutely mandatory. Uh, one Fading Flame Dragon. You only play this card if you're playing the Salamandra with Chain, uh, this card needs to shuffle back the correct fusion materials for the monster it's summoning, um, which means you need to summon, shuffle back the Flame Swordsman and the Fighting Flame Dragon. So bear that in mind. Uh, if you don't want to play Chain, or if you don't want to really focus too heavily on the secondary effect of Chain, you can absolutely cut this card. Uh, not mandatory to your combo whatsoever. Uh, you can absolutely drop it if you really wanted the space. I'm very tempted to. I think the only real circumstance under which you should be playing the Fading Flame Dragon is if you're playing two copies of the Ultimate Flame Swordsman. 
Uh, I think you're playing two of this guy. Sure. Uh, it makes sense then. Uh, if you're not playing two of this guy, then it, it's just so obscure in its usage that I, I honestly don't think it's worth playing. Um, so yeah. Uh, one Roland, uh, one Angelica, one Charles, all mandatory. Baron is very easy to summon. It becomes even easier the more copies of Renaud you're playing. So do bear that in mind. The Baron is absolutely summonable. Uh, Artorigus, necessary for some of your lands, and I also really like his anti-backrow capacity because that has come up more than once. Backrow is on the rise. Tempai is a pain in the dick uh, against most strategies that rely exclusively on monster effects, and, and while uh, most backrow decks aren't exactly amazing into Tempai either, they do present a unique challenge to Tempai. So we've, we've seen a bit of an increase in backrow based decks or backrow uh, based removal. Uh, floodgates, things like that. So Artorigus being able to sort of wipe, uh, mop up a little bit of back rows has been quite nice. Uh, Double Charles, very easy to summon. Uh, one is sold. I was playing two. You can absolutely play two. You've got room. If you really wanted to play two, you can, for sure. Um, Hita has not come up yet. I would imagine it will, though, because of the ubiquity of fire. You do get warrior locked quite a lot. But uh, I, don't, I don't know if I would say that. There's a lot of lands where you don't get warrior locks. So Hita, Hita can add value to some of your lands. So it's kind of relevant sometimes. Uh, it's more of a recovery play, though, if you get fucked up and you've, like, zero avenue for, for play. If you can go, like, Hita grab an Ash into Promethean, you can maybe make something happen. So it's nice as a fallback play, but if you did want to play Hita, you, you can absolutely cut it. It's not that, it's not that important. Uh, Ferocious Flame Swordsman is here for a very specific reason. He's basically here that if you need to get rid of Promethean Princess on your field, but your warrior locked, he's one of the better warriors that you can summon. You could also summon that Flame Tongue guy. Um, but, but, it's a, but it's a Flame Swordsman deck, man. Right? Come on, man. Come on. Behave yourself. Come on. Come on. Uh, Promethean Princess, obvious fucking reasons. Uh, and Raging Phoenix, like I said, was a recent addition. Absolutely optional. I would say these cards are optional. Uh, Baron is technically optional, but very good. I would say this is kind of the core of your extra. Uh, you have to play this. The other four spots, you can do whatever you want with. Um, I think it's silly not to play Baron. Uh, and I, I do like these other choices that I have put in. So do whatever you want with the extra, really. You, you can four spots to play with. The rest of it is, is fairly mandatory. And yeah, that is my list. That's sort of what we come up with. And again, do bear in mind that this was a list that was put together really, really quickly. I have a decent enough knowledge of, of, of Infernoble, so it wasn't like I was doing it totally with, with zero sort of knowledge base. Um, but this deck was thrown together quite quickly. There may be other better ways of utilizing the Flame Swordsman and the associated cards, and I will be looking for them. And if I find anything that's so much better than this, I will absolutely uh, make a video on it to, to sort of spread the love a little bit. But ultimately, that is it. All right, so we streamed this on Twitch. If you want to catch our live streams, I would absolutely recommend watching them. I think the live streams are the best part of my channel. Honestly, I don't know if anyone agrees with that or not. I personally find the live streams to be much more entertaining, not only to make and do, but also to watch. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. I'm, 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 a, bit, I'm a bit more of a live content type guy, but... um. I think if you're not watching the live streams, you're you're not getting anywhere near as much out of this channel as you could be. So even if you want to watch them back, that's fine. Um, we stream over on Twitch. Link is in the description. Absolutely hit it. Uh, I also do re-upload the VODs onto Converged Gaming Plus. So if you want to go and check out the VODs for our live streams, they're usually uploaded within a day or two later uh, onto Converge Gaming Plus. So do keep an eye for that as well. But that's pretty much everything. If you got this far and you're not uh, subscribed and you haven't liked this video yet, then what the fuck are you doing? Fix that. Uh, it takes two seconds. It's free. No reason not to do it. Hit the buttons, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.